Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to another NC State University Libraries Twitch stream. Uh, this stream is in uh, relation to the everyone. Wicked Welcome Problems and Wolfpack Solutions uh, pr set of programming. My name is Colin Keenan. I am a staff member with the North Carolina State University Libraries. And today I'm joined by Colin Bramer, uh, from the coordinator of the Natural World Investigate Lab at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Uh, and today we will be uh, talking a little bit about entomology, about uh, pollinators, and about our beautiful bees. We'll be playing a game called Bee Simulator and chatting a bit about climate change and its impact on our valuable pollinators. Right, exactly. And so we, even though this game, I think, is all about honeybees, there are actually 40,000 species of different bees in the world. We've got about 4,000 different species here in North America. So even though this focuses on one, there are a lot more out there and they're just as important for pollination as the honeybee itself. So yes, yeah. and climate change is affecting all of them at the very end. So we'll learn a little bit about that. We'll have some fun. Feel free to hop in the chat and uh, throw any questions that you have in there. I see some uh, great questions already uh, coming in. Feel free to hop in the uh, chat and, uh, and for any questions that you have in there. Seems like we may have a little bit of an echo. Bees. We we loved the uh, intro at the beginning of this game, so we'll uh, also take the chance to show you that. Let's get that fired up. Buzz, buzz, everybody. The sticky note. Mm -hmm. There we go. We're gaming here. Pollinating almost a hundred crops. Making it the most fruitful job in the world. But without them, That's a nice pun. <laughs> as we know it will end. <clears throat> that's definitely not a true statement, but that's uh, makes Why? good makes good drama for the for the game. Are there other types of pollinators? Is that why? Oh yeah, I mean honeybees they pollinate a lot of different things, but there are specific pollinators like there are squash pollinators that do pumpkin and other squashes, anything in that that group. The cucurbitaceae, and then you've got you know, blueberry blueberry bees and things that specifically pollinate specific crops and there are some that bees, bees can't even or honeybees can't even get to that are specific to like certain types of bees out west. Oh okay. Yeah. 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 A lot of, a lot of but they are important pollinators. Are pollinators. Yeah. There's just no end all be all pollinator. It's right. More yeah the most pressing thing with bees now um, is, is pretty much the pesticide thing. It's overused the nicotinoids or whatever the, the newest classes of insecticides. Mm -hmm. They're just because they have, they're they're good insecticides as far as like other pest, you know, pests for crops. But they they have long residual life, and so bees pick it up and take it back to the colony. It just poisons mm -hmm. the entire colony. So it is an issue, I and mean, we need it. We need it for, you know, agriculture. But we just have to be careful about the amount we use yeah, and exactly yeah, and how we clean use up it. after. Right, it. exactly. So we'll uh, jump into this Let's Buzz. We're playing on easy, difficult level, and at the first opportunity, we're gonna jump in and do some co-op play as soon as it offers us the chance. Um, <clears throat> and so you're gonna see Colin number one here <laughs> playing the game, and Colin number two here dying a lot, most likely. So just, just be ready. I don't know about that. Let's <laughs> see. Have player one playing on a controller, and player 
to on a controller. And I don't know if you press the X button, will that press this? Uh, we might have to play enough of the uh, story okay. to have it allow us to play co-op. So. <coughs> So our, our bee is here. Looks like I'm controlling our little bee here. Cool. So let's see how this bee flies. Would you say, can fl bees fly backwards like this? Yeah, they, they just can't. They're not, they can't fly upside down. I'm sure there are some that potentially could fly upside down. Flies, true flies are better flyers. But yes, bees can hover, fly backwards, forwards. They just can't go obviously full speed. It's like backing up in your car. Mm. You can't go full speed or backwards. And that little factoid at the beginning about how they found honey in Pharaoh's tombs thousands of years old, it's true. Honey is, is like one of the Earth's perfect foods. It never goes bad. Um, it may crystallize, right? It may, it may um, you just have to warm it up to, to reliquify it, but it never truly goes bad. Huh. I've always heard that fact and figured there's some sort of asterisk to it, but yep. you're saying it's actually... Yep. Yep. Unless it gets... Unless you get too much moisture in there and some bacteria can get in there, but otherwise if it's kept... At the right moisture level, which is about 18 percent, um, uh, so there's no more water in it. It will actually stay forever. Huh? That's crazy. All right. It's antimicrobial as well. Yes, that it is. They um, Alexander the Great used to pack his troops that had, that had gotten killed in battle in honey and ship them back home for burial. Oh wow! So their bodies wouldn't decay anymore. So it looks like our those golden beams that we were flying through earlier are a representation of honey. Or our pollen, rather. Okay. Um, so. Sorry, should pay attention to the game. No, I guess in here. I'm <laughs> too busy thinking about Alexander the Great. Whoa, I'm crashing. Oh, let's see. Get in the pollen, but let's see if it's packing onto their hind legs where they actually have the corbicula, these things that, where they collect the pollen. And are those hairs? Yeah, it's actually yeah. It's like a it's like a pollen basket. It's like this curvature in their back leg, and it does have specific hairs on it. And they kind of wipe the pollen off their bodies when they're when they're going to flowers for the nectar, and then they, they basically push it onto the, the pollen basket. And yeah, they actually are. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, we definitely saw that there's a spot for it, and now it's gonna kind of animate as we go on. Hmm. Look at the beautiful diversity of flowers that we're interacting with here. As a game dev, I've always thought that a uh, 3D navigation in open open air like this is really hard to build and make it feel natural, but this is awesome. It's uh, really, really in control. No, it's a beautiful. Yeah. What other factors are um, bees looking at as they buzz around looking for pollen? Well, honeybees, um, they actually do what's known as um, flower constancy. So they will go to a specific type of flower and then. Um, oh, a little loud. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'll bring it down a little. So the, the bees will actually go to the same type of flower and then when they go back to the hive, they'll let their sisters know hey, here's a, here's a good pollen source, here's a good nectar source. And then that's how they get the information. They do this thing called the waggle dance. But they'll go to the same type of flower until all the nectar's completely expended in that type of flower, and then they'll go to a different type of flower. That's why when they beekeepers rent out, you know, their hives for pollination of like almond and stuff, that's why it's yeah. so efficient because they're only going to that specific uh, flower. That's the only t thing that's flowering that time of year, anyway. And is that just an innate kind of pecking order of what they'll prioritize, or is that something it, that humans it's just, control? Yeah, it's just. Oh no no yeah it's just behavior of the bees they just they do the flower constancy on their own even like I my beehives in my backyard they they always go whatever's flowering but even if there are multiple things flowering like if holly and say tulip tree flower at the same time they'll they'll keep going to the holly and then you know another hive may just go to the the tulip tree first but they that's why you can get certain kinds of honey without it blending right. Wildflower honey is just a blend of different things, but that's why you can get specific like tulip tree honey because they know they're just packing in tulip tree nectar. I once insulted a beekeeper by asking if their honey that I had just tasted was clover, clover-fed honey, and they said they would never let their bees near clover. <laughs> 
and I didn't really know I had broken the code and asked a faux pas of a question. It's really not. Actually, clover honey is delicious, but clover honey is usually, I'm going to say it's a euphemism, but it's usually just that thing for like a blend of, of different nectars. So, oh, okay. Different, different honeys when they're bottling it. We have a question. How do beekeepers know and control what kind of pollen their bees go to? We might have just talked about how they don't really control. Yeah, they don't really control it unless it's something like, like up in the mountains when um, sourwood is blooming. Uh -huh. They will, most good beekeepers, if they're selling specific, they, you know, they, wanna, they want people to know that they just have sourwood honey, they'll actually put on fresh what are known as supers where the bees store the honey, uh, or sort of the nectar and turn it into honey. Um, and they'll they'll put fresh ones on so that when the sourwood is blooming and the bees do their bee con or their flower constancy, they'll only go to the sourwood. Oh. Um, so that's how bee or honey uh, bee creepers could potentially control it. But when there are a lot of different things blooming, like in the fall, when you have asters and goldenrod and stuff, that's why a lot of times when they're when people um, bottle the honey, that's why it's just a blend. That's why they call it wild wild okay. flower honey because it's just a, a various mixture of different things. Interesting. Are there any really desired after types of honeys where you control to one plant and there, it's more work and therefore a premium product? Or well, like that? the the most I think worldwide desirable one is manuka honey because it's only grown. I think it's only in, in New Zealand, but there's so much I hate to say fake honey on the market. Uh -huh. That's why you see it like at Whole Foods. You use oh it's manuka honey. It's for thirty six dollars. That's not manuka honey. Okay. That's something else. People are totally cheating the system on that one. But around here, sourwood honey is probably the most desired and valuable because it's only you can only get it up in at least in North Carolina up in the mountains. Um, you can see sourwood trees around, but for a good crop of honey, and uh, and you do have to be very specific to like have the Beekeepers Association qualified as official um, sourwood honey. That's it's really interesting. interesting. It's delicious. We had a question here. Um, yeah, sourwood is really highly prized, right? Um, that sounds like that's yep. uh, yeah. Yeah, the fact. Um, and we had a question about the floral diversity here. Um, I would say from, you know, I'm not a horticulturalist, I'm barely <laughs> a botanist. Um, but yeah, this is like a northeastern kind of hardwood stand yep. near water. You've got like, I saw some foxglove we might have uh, touched earlier, lots of asters, um, and then some... Yeah, radial, you know, water radially lilies. symmetrical. You have yep. water lilies in there. Tulips, I think, is what those are. S these purple flowers are supposed to be. Maybe I might be wrong about that. So um, like very large bluebells or something. But yeah, yeah, you got a lot of asters, the, the yeah, black-eyed Susans, old brown there, Susans. Maybe. Yep. Oh, that's definitely goldenrod. Yeah. You know, and when I think of goldenrod, I think of wasps, not bees. Mm -hmm. But um, that's a classic plant biology lab where you go out and you cut open the goldenrod galls to see if you can find parasitic wasps in there. Um, so I like this feature that they just introduced. So if we press our right button down, mm -hmm. we see bee vision. Ah, there so we go. I imagine this is infrared? Ultraviolet. Okay. Ultraviolet, yeah, okay. Yeah, you don't see infrared, but yeah, it's ultraviolet. And that's what's really cool. I was talking, the third column that's here in the, <laughs> in the library, he was actually asking about that. And so yeah, bees, when they see, they can see in the normal wavelength and ultraviolet. And so flowers appear completely different to them than it does to us, obviously. Wow. Because so they're seeing in different wavelengths. There's a lot of um, discussion amongst botanists about that and how there's lots of evolutionary pressures that we don't necessarily see very well from right. just our naked eye. And uh, there was a great Cornell study throughout the 2000s and early teens. It's probably still ongoing, doing the nature of a land grant kind of study like that, but um, about how these flowers are seen by bugs and uh, insects and particularly pollinators um, and whether there's evolutionary pressures that are being manifested that are just things that are very obvious but we just don't observe very well. Yeah, well I'm sure there are and then when you have all the different horticulture varieties, you know what I mean, we're selecting for it's like, oh this is a pretty color but you know and we're wondering why aren't we getting seed, why isn't the flower doing well? It's probably because the pollinators don't see it as the same way and they're ignoring <laughs> it because it's probably doesn't show up this literally on their radar in a sense. Making cool music in a genre bees don't care about. <laughs> uh, looks like we have our little meter almost perfect here and we had a great question about um, so if honey is a perfect food can you bring it back from its crystallization state? Yeah all you have to do is you put it in 
in a container, don't pour it into a pan. So you keep it in a container, glass or plastic, and warm it up uh, in, a, in like a pan of water, just a little shallow pan of water and warm the water. Don't boil the water. All you're trying to do is reliquify it, and then once you reliquify it, it'll you know, be fine again. It might recrystallize. Uh -huh. And certain honeys, um, like tulip tree, or excuse me, uh, sourwood honey takes a long, long, long time to crystallize. Other ones crystallize a lot faster. But yeah, just a pan of warm water, and you just got to pay attention to it so it doesn't boil, because you can uh, overcook it. And just, yeah, that's all you have to do to, to uncrystallize it, just to liquefy it. That's awesome. Time to take it back to the hive. Um, but actually, crystallized honey is actually pretty good to spread on, like toast or something too. Yeah. <coughs> um, we were talking earlier about. Can you remind me of the name of the anatomical part where this pollen is being stored? That is actually they're called pollen baskets or okay. the corbicula. So, corbicula. so the pollen baskets are more common because uh, bumblebees also have the pollen baskets. We're well, looking pretty full here, so we'll take them back uh, and stash our honey, or stash our pollen to make honey, probably. Nope. Honey is, honey is nectar, it's bee vomit. They actually kind of put it in their honey crop and then keep like, um, well I don't say eating it, they, they put it in their honey crop and keep kind of re regurgitating it to get the moisture out of it. Uh, but the pollen itself is the protein source for the lark. Oh, so okay. adults only eat nectar or eat honey when they, when they need sugars, because that's all they eat is carbohydrates, but the pollen is only fed to the, the lark. Oh, okay, yeah, huge misconception there then, okay. Uh, we've learned a new feature. Beetro is your special bee speed boost. Uh, <laughs> is that a is that a biologically correct phrase, Beetro? Uh, <laughs> I guess it can be now. Sure, it can be. We'll coin uh, it. The arrow indicator on the bottom left shows your Beetro energy. Fill it up by collecting pollen from several types of flower, or no, sorry, several flowers of an identical type in a row, cool. or by eating human sweets through the park. Okay, we're going to the park, I think. Cool. And that's uh, that's the other thing with, with people who keep bees, if they live near, say, the fairgrounds or something, certain times of year they may notice that their um, honey supers are actually full of green or some other colored quote-unquote honey, and it's actually just like, you know, melted um, icy treats or whatever the bees are going after. They'll just go after anything that's sweet. Huh. So does it ruin honey if it... It, well, technically, yeah. There's some people that will feed unethical beekeepers will actually feed their bees sugar water so that they get a crop of honey so they have something to sell, but it's not honey. They'll take whatever sweet and convert it into a honey-like substance, but what makes honey honey is it comes from nectar. Mm -hmm. People are uh, having their mind blown by the bee vomit uh, being <laughs> what honey is. Um, so pollen is fed to the baby bees and they vomit. No, actually the, 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 the larvae or the baby bees don't vomit the honey. The adult bees, the sisters, they're the ones collecting the nectar from the flowers. And they actually, when you have, there's a hierarchy of work in the hive. So the ones out collecting the nectar will fly back to the hive. They'll actually pass it off to one of their sisters who's working in the hive that's meant to make the honey. And then that one will take in the nectar put it in her honey crop and basically regurgitate it. So the larvae are just, there are worker bees they're called nurse bees that actually just feed the larvae. And they actually feed it, it's a mixture of honey and pollen, it's called bee bread. It's the right mixture, it's got the right protein and carbohydrate. It's just like, you know, if you're eating nutritionally properly, you eat like, what, 30% protein and 40% mm -hmm. carbs mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Um, so they're, they're actually feeding that to the larvae. So the larvae grow nice and big and strong, and then they seal off the thing and when they're ready to pupate and become an adult. But the adult bees themselves are the ones making the honey. So the larvae just are there just to eat and grow. Hmm. Uh, <coughs> seems like that explained the uh, point of confusion there. <laughs> so I'm trying to grab the same type of flower here repeatedly. Let's look. I'm looking for these. Uh, I don't know if that was the same. I was looking for the white um, buttercups or whatever those kind of tulip looking guys. Your, words, you know, your little arrows on the screen. Oh yeah, there so we go. Oh, that's one. my beetro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now I can puzzle on, do a high speed bee crash because I don't think I have very con good control yet. Uh, did, we did drop off our first batch of pollen now. I like 
there's these flowers all growing in this kind of cave area. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, lots of sun. Just in, <laughs> <was gonna> say, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don't know where the, the light is coming for this, but... I'm willing to suspend some disbelief for the <laughs> tutorial level especially, I think. Uh, Uh, someone in the chat heard that sugar water is good for uh, tired bees. Uh, if you see a bee still on a flower on the ground, what should you do? Is it just sleeping? No, um, bees actually, in the truest sense, they will work themselves to death. So if it's later in the evening, sometimes bees will just like hang out in the flower. They don't sleep, they're just, it's cold enough and they can't make it back because they go off of the direction of the sun to find their hive, so they can't necessarily fly at night. So they may just hang out on a flower until the sun comes up and then they can navigate back to their hive. Um, but sometimes they literally just will keep collecting nectar and pollen until they literally die out in the field. Oh. They'll, just, they'll just die. Or so. That doesn't seem like an optimal strategy <coughs> um, in terms of if you're trying to get stuff back to the hive. Is, oh, that, no. is it just like that it gets mitigated by how many bees there are? That uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, a good healthy hive will have 60,000 bees, worker bees. Um, and not all of those are foragers, but they'll have a large portion are foraging, so it's not just like one bee that they're relying on to bring back all the, all the nectar and the pollen. There's only one queen, and she's the mother, and everybody else in the hive are all sisters, um, except for males, which are drones. They mean they're only half related, but they also might be coming from a different hive. Why are they only half related? Because they only have their... their um, it's a, they come from an unfertilized egg, so they're they're not 100% related. It's the whole genetics thing about you know they they're they're um, haploid, and the the females all the sisters are diploid. Mm -hmm. So the so the brothers or the drones are are only halfway related to the females because they're only they only have half of the genes. Oh, okay. Um, so it's not it's that it's being replaced by something else, it's just no. that they have the, the, what, the denominator is lower yes. or something? Yeah. <coughs> kind V. Alice is our Obi-Wan, is explaining how everything works to us. So somebody said something about having a bee killer wasp in there. Oh, yeah, cicada killer. There's something I saw a bee killer. Yeah, is it true that bees can't... Okay, so our first question, is it true that bees can't fly in the rain? Um, and we can talk about bee moving as we move along. Well, they can fly in the rain, they just prefer not to, because when you think of the size of a, especially a heavy rainstorm, the size of a raindrop compared to a bee, you know, they get waterlogged, it's, it's difficult for them to fly. But I, I mean, my hives, if it starts raining, they'll still be out flying back and forth until it really starts pouring, and then you won't see any more of them going out. Um, I imagine we'll have lots of hive questions as we move into mm -hmm. the level we're in right now. Um, but we had a question about uh, cicada killer wasps. Uh huh. Yep. Cicada killer wasps. Oh. What? Um, yeah. The cicada killer wasps are, are a completely different um, group. They're not bees at all. Obviously, they're wasps. But they literally will. The females will go and capture a cicada, sting it to paralyze it, so they don't kill it, mm -hmm. uh, and then they. They take it back to their burrow and bury it in the ground, lay an egg on it. So the reason they're not killing it, they're paralyzing it, and so the thing stays alive, so their larvae will have something to eat, and so it doesn't just start rotting. Because if it killed it, it would just start rotting. And parasitic wasps are a gigantic clade, probably. There's a, a probably there are a lot of, of different parasitic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are a lot of different, a lot of different parasitic wasps. But this this one is is not a parasite. It's just a predator. Oh, okay. Cicadas. So parasitic wasps are things like uh, braconid wasps and ichneumonids and a completely separate thing. So those are the ones that if you see them on like caterpillars in your in your garden or something mm -hmm. like that, those are the ones obviously you want to keep around. I okay. mean, you want to keep everything around because it's all right. like, part of the, the ecosystem. Um, but yeah, completely different thing. Uh, what are your thoughts on the beehive as we see it for the first time from the inside here? It's uh, interesting. It Well... The, the comb up there that's hanging straight down, that's more what they build. They'll build from top to bottom um, and with, with the hexagons. And it's fantastic just seeing how they build comb from scratch and just the, the engineering of it. Because this is lighted, but in an actual beehive, 
it's pitch black. Mm -hmm. And so all they're seeing is, or they're actually sensing everything, and it's all pheromones and, and by feel. And so they're not really seeing anything. It's only when the forager bees are out, you know, collecting the nectar and stuff that they're actually seeing the sunlight. So Do they have non-visible light ability to sense their surroundings in there, or is well, it just... Well, the antennae. The okay. antennae and, and the, the hairs on their body. So they're sensing everything's around them, but it's mainly, it's mainly a scent thing. So they're okay. mainly going off pheromones. Um, and that's where they're, they're basically smelling their way around everything. But So all the lumpy stuff, mm -hmm. uh, Hyde wouldn't like that. They like, they really like order. Sometimes you'll get what's known as cross-combing, like they're building their comb straight you know straight rows of comb they might they might build some weird brace comb or something in between it but yeah they're they're not going to have things like this huh um yeah i would look at this as a game environment and think that what's in the screen right now is just added in to keep there from being a bare spot but you're saying that's actually the more accurate spot right so if they go into a tree hollow they would start they would find a tree hollow that's that's large enough that that is a comfortable size for them and they would start building combs straight down from the top just like that huh Cool. And this um, looks like some sort of plant matter or moss, or are these maybe rocks that are just embedded uh, in here? I'm not really sure. It, yeah, it looks like looks like moss to me. Well, these are definitely fungi. So. Yeah. I guess that's just the base of the tree. Yeah, maybe we're in the. We got some spider webs. So yeah, something going on. And this. Something else to ah, maybe you got through the tutorial. I think so. Yeah. So let's. Maybe there's some. Hmm. This looks like a two player icon to me, but. Okay, I might have to follow my icons. <laughs> <laughs> so icons on the screen for a reason. Is there a plant life within beehives? No, they keep it. Beehives are super duper clean. I mean, they are probably some of the, the cleanest animals because they're they don't want you know bacteria or anything growing in there because that's where they're raising their young it's just like your own home you know, generally you don't keep it messy and your kid you know living in a garbage dump and, and whatever just because you know you're trying to protect your offspring so that's really what they're doing they're protecting their food source which is the honey and the pollen and they're protecting their their sisters essentially all the larvae that are in there. So yeah, it's, it's super, super clean. And that's why you see insects a lot of times, especially bees, they're constantly cleaning themselves and cleaning their antennae because that's how they're sensing the world. So they can't afford to not sense it. So it looks like we have a new character here and she is a guardian character as opposed to um, our guide earlier. Oh, and this is our queen. So she referred to us as her newest child. Is that accurate that a one of the youngest larvae would be uh, out foraging uh, nope. pollen? Nope, larvae are just in the cells. So that this is actually an adult now. Okay. But they do they do have that hierarchy. So when bees first emerge, pupate in, in their adults, the first thing their first job is to clean up the hive. So they're basically like maids. And then as the weeks go on, then they become nurse bees, so they take care of the young, which is a very important job. And then their final week of life, essentially, is when they go out to become a forager. So it's, okay. it's like one of the most important jobs because you're relying, they're relying on you to bring back the food for the, the larvae and all that. But it is, they, they are all daughters of the queen. Mm -hmm. They're all sisters. And the guard bees, even though they're not guarding one <laughs> queen, they do have guard bees in a hive. They actually do stand outside the, the um, they sit right outside the entrance of the hive and make sure no yellow jackets or other other predators come by. That's why if any mammals come by and start sniffing around, they get a snoot full of bee stings. Yeah, they're at the ready. Right. Um, is the scale of the queen here about accurate? Uh, no, queens are not that much bigger. Uh, queens, the, the body shape is accurate because queens have a nice big long abdomen. Their, their wings are relatively small compared to the rest of their body. Mm -hmm. um, and But the, the queen is not that much larger really proportionally to the other okay. But you just, you can always see a queen because she just has a different shape to have them. And she kind of lumbers along on the comb. Um, yeah, it's just one of those things you get, a, you get an eye for. And that's why a lot of times when you're beekeeping, you, you, you mark your queen 
with like an enamel paint, like a little spot on her thorax. It doesn't affect the her scent or her pheromones or anything like that, but you can always spot her so when you she's running around. Spot her walking around. around. Yeah. That's why, because she's about the same size as the other one, same coloration, so it's really hard to see. Uh, I have two more questions before we leave this mm -hmm. area. Um, what are these folks right here doing, and what are these markings up on the tree? Those trunk? markings are, that's actually really cool they included that. Those are actually bark beetle tunnels. So you can tell they're inside of a tree because that would actually be just underneath the bark. If you ever peel bark off of like a pine tree or you see a dead tree, you'll see those tunnels. And so bark beetles lay their eggs, and the larvae actually eat the cambium layer of the tree. Um, and, and then they, uh, they emerge as, as beetles, so bark beetles are usually really small. But that, yeah, that's completely accurate. That's, that's really pretty cool. cool. And then those, it looks like they're either feeding on something. That, when you see that in cells of bees, the white um, gelatinous looking stuff, it's actually, it's actually um, royal jelly. And they feed that, mm -hmm. they feed that to all larvae, but when they're making a new queen, they'll actually feed it more royal jelly, and that's what gives her the ability to grow larger and be able okay. to have mature ovaries and mate. Is there an anthrocentric uh, product made out of royal jelly or anything? Do people well, harvest it? People harvest it, and it's it's really expensive because they don't produce that much of it. But it doesn't do anything. Okay. It's one of those, you know, it, yeah. It, it's more of like folk medicine kind okay. of things, like okay. rhino horns or whatever. <coughs> uh, how did the bees make royal jelly? Who makes it too, I guess? They actually produce it from uh, glands in their head. And so all worker bees can produce royal jelly. They don't produce it all the time, but like I said, they only produce it when they're first, mainly the nurse bees, when they're first feeding the young. But even if you have, like say your colony, something happens to it, uh, and you, you split the colony, or they, they swarm, and they're starting a new colony, older bees who used to be foragers can always go back to taking care of the young. They still, it's kind of like a job they already knew, and so they can always produce royal jelly and, and take care of the young. Uh, right now our stream about bees is very colony, right? You know, Colin and Colin. Yep, right yep. Yeah. <laughs> and so one thing, if you uh, want to learn a lot about pollinators, you can always uh, attend some of the bug fest things that we have here, we are, we are attacked by flies, right? Nice. So those be a dead organism here? Somewhere? Must be, how we can find that track and see. We're in the big bad world of the park now. Um, sorry, you were mentioning oh, yeah, Bug just, Fest. Yeah, so you can always, you can always, we have a lot of uh, uh, virtual things going on Bug Fest. It's, it's uh, next week, September 13th through the 17th, and then there's actually a pollinator party out at Prairie Ridge Eco Station um, from 9.30 to 12 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, the 18th. And then there's a moth party, so they're going to look for moths and, and um, collect and uh, identify, not kill, just collect and release moths from 8.30 to 10 at night. You can find all that information on bugfest.org, which is part of the naturalsciences.org website. Cool, it looks like we got a link there in the chat for anybody okay. watching Perfect. along as well. It's really fun. I mean, there's some, I sat in on some of the practice talks, and there are some people that are just, they know their stuff, and it's just really great information. Bookfest is one of those really cool, unique uh, just uh, events that we have in the area every year that I'm always really uh, glad we have. Yeah. Uh, do, what's your uh, historic involvement in Bugfest been like? Oh, I, I've, I'm an entomologist. I study flies, but actually I created a, um, a, a native pollinator table. So even before you know, all the, the, the native bee stuff was popular. <laughs> I created a bee, just to let people know, there are a lot of, lot of bees that we have around here that aren't honeybees, um, and that there are a lot of native pollinators. There are early spring pollinators. They're ones that they, most of them nest in the ground, and most people think they're yellow jackets, but they're not. They're solitary, um, and they don't form colonies like honeybees. Each female does her own thing and produces her own nest and all that type of stuff. So. So there, you can stand in this in a field of a thousand of them, and they don't they won't sting you whatsoever. You're just like a tree stump, and it's just fantastic to observe them. So, looks like you're yeah, we might be in a zoo right oh, now. Oh, I was gonna say, it's like how did you get that? First, I thought they're they look like large dogs with antlers. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, these are red deer, I suppose. Uh, um, so producing honey and being a pollinator are not synonymous. They no, no. Th honey bees are the only things, are the only, I guess, pollinators that produce honey, at least what we would consider honey. There are other bees that produce kind of a liquid, but most bees, and they're more efficient pollinators than honeybees, they actually um, are more efficient because all they're doing is collecting pollen and they lay their egg on a pollen ball and then they seal up a, a cell. And that's what the, the, the larvae will develop into an adult just off that pollen ball. So they have to be more efficient to get that kind of, um, to, to get more offspring. Okay. So they can keep their gene, their oh, lineage going. So yeah, the only reason honeybees are important to, to us is because we get honey and wax from them, and that's why they're they're kept, and that's why they're 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 actually they're not native here in North America. They're that's why they're called the European honeybee. They're native okay. to Europe, um, and so they're introduced in most other places in the world. So, so the inter interesting thing about them. Do they have like six continent range now, or? Yeah, everywhere except Antarctica. Oh, wow. So they're they're everywhere. And the bug, the theme insect for Bugfest this year is one of those. Well, I think they're the a non-honey producing bee that yes, we're kind of yeah. talking about. Yes, carpenter bees are, are solitary bees as well. And you know, people consider them a, a, a pest because they drill into like a porch railing or something like that. But actually, carpenter bees, while they may drill a hole, they don't do really structural damage, and they're super efficient pollinators. If it weren't for them, a lot of the fall plants wouldn't get pollinated. Um, and they're really large and they look really scary but they're once again they're harmless unless you try to grab onto them because the female is solitary she's just going to try to fly away from you not fly at you and they're just they're fun to watch and you can actually go up when they're 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 usually so concentrated when they're getting nectar and pollen you can actually go up and and kind of pet them when they're on a flower <laughs> I've never seen that don't before. don't grab onto them but you can just <laughs> sit there and literally you know brush their backs really gently now if you see one on a flower and it's got a yellow spot on its face. That's a male, and they don't have males don't have stingers because stingers are, are ovipositors. So you can actually grab onto the male, but make sure it's got that yellow spot on its face first. Otherwise, you're not going to be too pleased. I'm very confused, and the chat is yelling at me to on what to do. Helpfully, telling me to use my B vision, but that is not. I don't think the command right now. It's not responding to that. Um, Probably because you're got, in the hive. Yeah, we got to get rid of this. We got to get rid of all this pollen. We're just running around with our pockets full right now. <laughs> Let's see. Losing my way around the hive. Good job, me. I've gathered tons of pollen. Time to take That's it back to the Our hive. internal dialogue as B skip. So, oh, oh, we're close. We're, um, we make a left up here maybe? I don't know. I always get lost. In <laughs> That's part of I'm time. a horrible gamer. I wouldn't you? Yeah. Would you? I was gonna say. Would you put it in one of those little, one of the little pots that they have on the ground? Ooh, we, like can try, we can try. We can try. You gotta use it outside. Uh, yeah. Uh. <laughs> yes, you are helpfully yelling. Not <laughs> yelling is good in many, in more it's cases so than not in my experience. <laughs> um, before I gather more, I have to take stuff back to the hive. But yeah, we're in that hive. We needed that, um, there was like a glowing um, comb that we could drop it off at earlier, I remember, hmm. and we're struggling to find it now. Too good the little. Okay, I think. Arrow doesn't give you like somebody in the, the chat range. has a better idea than I do. I think we got to go outside and deposit it on the combs. Oh. So much pollen. Before I gather more, I have to take this stuff back to the hive. Do bees get lost? What's up? Uh, generally not. They they find their way around the hives, like I said, by by the pheromones, so they kind of know where they're going. Actually, one of the interesting thing is when a bee will come back, and other bees in the hive will. They'll antenate, they'll tap the, the bee that just came back from gathering some nectar, and they'll tap them, and basically, if the bee that came back doesn't give them a sample or like regurgitate a little bit of the nectar, 
they'll actually get really aggressive with it because it's kind of like you're not helping the colony. So uh, they, they always come back, they share the nectar, they do their waggle dance, which is they basically waggle the number of times the distance and the angle to the sun so they know how to find it. Uh, and then they, they take off. But if they don't share, they're basically, it's almost like, you're not sharing with us, we're going we're gonna to beat you up. Huh. We need to find the rare pollen to top off our pollen supply. Hmm. How do you tell the rare pollen? <laughs> we have some critical uh, game design analysis happening in the, <laughs> in the chat <laughs> from some fellow game makers. Um, so we're looking for our yellow. And this is kind of that pollen priority prioritization you were talking about, but there's a pecking order. Flower constancy. So is that what it's looking for? Is the yeah, I think it wants a specific yeah. type of flower. Interesting, yeah. What is uh, that constancy principle? It's basically just like, like if they start collecting from, say, holly in the spring, and even if there are other things um, blooming, because the bee that was out where they're known as scout bees, they're going out finding finding the nectar, and they take it back to the hive, all those bees that are getting a sample of that holly will go after the holly. And so they're constantly, you know, they're, they're doing a constant just for that type of, of nectar and that type of, of um, pollen until the they've completely used up all the, the nectar in that plant, and then some other bee will be going out getting whatever else is blooming you know, like winter jasmine or something, mm -hmm. which I know is like a lot earlier than holly. But then they'll just go after that winter jasmine. So they're just going after whatever the the, four, the, the initial scout bees are telling them that's blooming right now or that has a lot of nectar. And the cool thing is bumblebees will actually lay down a pheromone on a flower that they've gotten the nectar out of so other bumblebees won't waste their time getting the nectar from that because there's Whoa. no nectar left. And so it's because most of the bumblebees, they're not all from the, the same colony, but it's it's kind of kind of cool. It's really good inventory <laughs> management. Um, we have a comment saying, there is this one bee that is exclusive to one of my favorite plants, uh, the Passiflora bee, uh, but the uh, person in the chat knows very little about them. Do you know anything uh, about the Passiflora bee? I don't, actually. I'm trying to think of Maybe Passiflora isn't the, that's not the mate, the mate pop, is it? Is that Passiflora? I'm not a botanist. Oh, uh, no, yeah, see, that's escaping me. Yeah, yeah, I don't know the common name for that. Um, I can picture Passiflora, but I don't know the. Hey, but if you go to bugfest.org and if you go to the <laughs> pollinator thing on Saturday, you'll be able to ask those questions. Whoa, we're not limited by the fence. Look at that. Am I right over it? All right, so you don't have to eat eggs. What's the green then? I think they're just like another, you know, they're using the the vivid colors to show differences between okay. without having to pop up text over what type of plant it is and probably. But is it prioritizing for you? Like you should go after the yellow and not yes, the green? Yes, okay. I think so, okay. yeah. And I imagine that the game design principle behind that is trying to cut down the total amount of text mm -hmm. so that you don't take Makes the emphasis sense. off of the actual educational content, right. which is the insects. We worked on a plant biology game a couple of years ago where we found ourselves arguing for two weeks over what a what a buffalo should look like. <laughs> and then we were like, well, this is not a buffalo education game. Uh, it was like oh, but trust me, somebody would point <laughs> that out if you didn't have that in there. Yeah, it's, like, it was a good, <laughs> good endeavor, kind of good exercise, but... Okay. It's here, maybe. Oh, we've got a distressed bee. Do you need help getting back to the hive? Wow, I have so much pollen. Okay, we're gonna follow them to make sure they make it back home. Okay, is this something that uh, we talked about distressed and tired bees earlier? Uh, would they ever get? Would there be a rescue mission ever for them? Or are they? Mm, no, they're no. kind of. It's it's. They're kind of on their own. The only time you see bees interacting like that is if they're trying to rob another colony, and so you get the guard bees being defensive, or you'll see 
bees carrying out the dead and they, they drop them so that they don't have dead bees, obviously, mm-hmm. in the colony. And, and polluting it, essentially. But yeah, they don't go on rescue missions. Do they reuse the the chitin or any nope, else? Nope, they just, if, if a bee is dead, they take it and they dump it away from the hive. And For fear that it's a disease. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, anything rotting is going to potentially bring in bacteria and things you don't want in the, in the hive, so... They dump them. That's why if you see a looks like a bee carrying another one, or a dead bee drops out of the sky, it's just a, a bee, a, a cleaner bee was just dropping it off and getting it out of their head. So we're <coughs> flying through a very human environment right now. Uh, are there particular things that happen in these formerly natural or controlled natural park environments that confuse bees, or? Well, garbage cans, people throw their sweets if, if they're, you know, glasses of soda or anything that's sweet. They may be going after that. And they're not, you know, obviously trying to sting you or, or do anything to uh, the human. But it's just to them, it's just, hey, something sweet. And, you know, it's an easy easy sugar source. Because remember, they're, they're just trying to load up their nest with honey and you know, flowers are their obviously evolutionary thing that they're going after, but since we've created these sugary liquids, yeah. they're just like, it's carbohydrates, we don't care, we'll just, you know, load up the thing with um, carbohydrates of any sort and pack it into what we consider honey. So hummingbird it's, feeders, does that? Yeah, that's a big on. problem. Um, and the problem with it is, is because it's uh, monosaccharide, essentially, or polysaccharide it's not nutritionally nectar has a lot more to it mm-hmm. right it's got um, amino acids and all these different chemicals in it so it's a lot healthier for them it's just like if bees only have one type of pollen um, that's why a really healthy hive you'll see will have multicolored pollen packed in there and that just means they have a healthy diet it's just like if you mm-hmm. just ate pizza all the time <laughs> it's not, I tried that it's not the best. best for you <laughs> tastes good but it's not the best for you So that's why bees, when they go after the almond, like almond growers will use the beehives. Um, it's the, the bees are actually not doing well because they only have the almond pollen and it's just, they're basically starving nutrition. Oh, uh, okay. The other danger with humans in parks is that humans automatically start swatting at them. And that's what I tell even little kids. It's like, if something's flying around you, it's curious, it's not going after you, so if you don't squat, it's going to leave you alone after a while. Because it's just like, hmm, what's the smell or what's this thing? But if you start swatting at it, you know, it's just like if, if you know, you walked up to somebody and they took a swing at you, you wouldn't really like it and you kind of get defensive, yeah. right? So it's the same idea. They're just like, well, what are you trying to hit me for? And that's when they they get aggressive and start stinging because they think you're trying to hurt it. And it's just curious. Are there animals that are particularly good or bad at that principle of not getting stung by being calm? No. I think anything, <laughs> anything, any, well, actually, most animals that are smart, except for, like, bears that are going after the larvae and the, the honey, most other animals will get away if, if something, you know, dangerous is. That's why, that's why they're, they're, you know, they have the, the aposomatic coloration yellow and black or, or white and black it's basically saying I'm poisonous or I'm dangerous mm-hmm. and so most animals are generally smart enough like yellow jackets they're smart enough to stay away from them because they're that bright color you nosy little bee. we're being talked to by a wasp oh. now nah. <laughs> we'll pay for disturbing Avery's meal yeah we'll see uh oh oh no when the indicator is blue, block. When in red, attack. Got my RPG head on here. I was going to say. <laughs> What's actually interesting is honeybees do. Be, like when you're beekeeping, even if you're veiled up um, and have your whole outfit on, I know you're looking at that veil. I'm not going to put that on right now. <laughs> <laughs> they actually will. They'll, they'll sit there before they sting because honeybees will die when they sting because the end of their abdomen rips off. 
um, but they will actually headbutt you a bunch of times trying to get you to go away uh. before they actually have to sting you. So they're kind of giving you a warning. It's like, get away, get away, get away. And if you don't walk away, that's when they finally sting. So Yeah, it's not in their best interest yeah. to be stinging all day, probably. Exactly. Because they can only sting once. Yellow jackets have a smooth stinger. They can sting you all day. And if they go to it, so basically. Yeah, I found but, yeah. out about that over this, this past summer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not, not pleasant. But, yeah. but honeybees can only sting once. So they, they, that's why they consider it the altruism. They're protecting the hive. They're giving their life for it. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not, you know, it's a human attribute. Um, but yeah, they, they literally will headbutt in order to get um, things away from them. Uh, what is the bee combat style? Is it, I can't imagine it's 1v1 while flying in the air like this. No, they generally, they, if they need to get defensive, they'll grab on. They'll actually, before they start singing, they'll actually start biting and try to overpower whatever's coming in. But if, if something's coming near their hive, a bunch of the guard bees, they'll release an, what's known as an alarm pheromone. Uh -huh. And so a bunch of the bees from that colony will start just mobbing whatever's coming in. Okay. And they'll, they'll all go after Power them. numbers. Um, humans leave a lot of food lying around. Mm -hmm. And then there's fruit, too. You can gain beetro energy by munching oh. on them. Uh, find edible snacks using bee vision. And to eat a snack, land on it using vertical steering. Ooh, I didn't know I had uh, <laughs> helicopter steering. That would have been vertical earlier when I was failing those tasks. It's a good day's work. Time to go home. Uh, can bees bite as well? Yes. They, they can't really bite as you would think... Um, I would say like a dog or a cat or something like that. Their mandibles, which are their jaws, they actually are, they're more like an ice cream scoop. They're smooth, they're, they're meant for manipulating pollen and honey and wax to form it into those, those combs. So they can kind of try to pinch, but it's more of a, it's not gonna uh, break your skin. It's more of like a grabbing on so they can jam that stinger. Uh, okay. so, so you can't knock them off, so they can actually get that stinger in. And so they're going after something attacking their hives. They'll grab onto it just to try to, like, I don't want to say tear it apart, but just try to keep it in place yeah. so they can overpower it. But yeah, something like a yellow jacket, since they eat meat, they actually have really sharp jaws and they can actually cut your skin if they're, if, if you give them enough time. But usually they're stinging you enough where you're not going to be standing around, which I wouldn't be. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any positives to uh, bee venom? Um, it's been found, it's not, uh, some people get into bee venom therapy and supposedly it's good for um, like rheumatoid arthritis and things like that, but you have to be careful with that and it's not something that you should go out and just get stung by bees because if you get stung enough, just like with any other antibody, your body can overreact to it. Oh, okay. And that's what that's what when people are allergic to the bees, their body is just overreacting. Autoimmune sensitivity. Um, right. Like that. And and so I had a professor who studied yellow jackets throughout his his PhD, and you know he he used, literally wrote the book on yellow jacket colonies in North America. Mm -hmm. um, and so when years later, after he had not studied the bees, he or the the yellow jackets, he had get, gotten stung enough in graduate school that whenever he would get stung. He would just go home, like sit down in a chair wherever he was, and just make sure he wasn't going to go into like anaphylaxis yeah. or something, because his body yeah. would automatically react because it had been such a long time that it, it, you know, it would just react strongly. So you got to be careful of that. It's something that's not been 100% proven with the venom, um, but it is not a powerful venom in the sense of it, it does cause pain, but it has a lot more. Um, reactants in it, I guess, that, that it, it affects a lot more things. Like yellow jackets, they'll sting, it'll burn for a little bit, it'll go away, but like with honeybees, it's got a lot more toxins in it, or a lot more uh, effective, I guess, chemicals in it, mm -hmm. so it'll it'll hurt for a lot longer. Okay. Plus their stinger, because it's barbed, it'll keep working its way into your skin, and that's why they say if you get stung by a honeybee, just quick, like take a fingernail or something, just scrape the top of your skin just to get the, the venom sack off of it, because it'll just keep pumping the venom in, and the stinger will just keep working its way into your skin. And I got stung once, I didn't even realize it. It was a honeybee, and man, that thing, that stinger in there itches for like weeks. Yeah, oh, it, if you don't it, get it, it out immediately. It itches like crazy, and it doesn't hurt, it just itches. So, so if you're stung, go across thing. it with a fingernail just, just or a credit really card quickly, or something just like that? Because 
when the when the back of the abdomen pulls off, um, the venom stack stays on the stinger, which is in your skin, and yeah. so it, it the, the muscle that's associated with that venom stack it just keeps pumping the venom in. So the longer you leave it on there, it's just going to pump more and more venom. So if you just get it off really quick, it'll, it might swell up a little bit, but in like an hour it'll be gone. Interesting. Okay. okay. Um, so on the we have a compass now. We're still getting new tools. Um, always have the hive and quest location symbols. Seems that we've actually had that, and then challenge symbols if we're nearby. Hmm. I want to know what we're gonna do about this construction crew outside the outside the tree. I feel like that's gonna be a problem for yeah, us eventually. Bet you Twenty bucks, they're gonna to try to take them. Yeah. Let's hope they don't try to treat you. And I saw a thing. Why are some bees fuzzy? Bees. Bees are. They look fuzzy. It's the the seedy. We call them hairs, but they're not only mammals of hairs. But because they're they're seedy, are um, trichomes. So they're 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 they're, they, they're multi-branched. It's to make them more efficient pollen collectors. So the pollen will stick to those hairs and then they, they can take it back and feed it to their larvae. So this is all bees. Solitary bees as well as honeybees and, and bumblebees and, and all that. Whereas wasps, since they eat meat as the protein source and in that pollen, they don't need to be all fuzzy and so they don't need the pollen sticking to them. So they're not as, they, they do pollinate in some sense because they go after nectar as adults but they're not as efficient of pollinators. Mm, okay. so. Only mammals have hairs. I didn't. I didn't realize that. So it's mm -hmm. a fibrous material that's like a hair, but not it, a hair. Well, it's or? it's shaped like a hair, but it's actually made of chitin, the same thing okay. as an exoskeleton. Whereas your hair and mammal hair is actually keratin. Okay. So same thing as your fingernails. Cool. Yeah, that's the really different interesting. Protein. So 3D printer working with a different filament, yeah, basically. Yeah. That's why I tell everybody, man, evolution's pretty cool. <laughs> Weird stuff. Okay, so we have to go to the bee library, obviously. As soon as the game mentions a bee library, we'll, we're on the library's Twitch channel. We're going to spend some time <laughs> there. Um, but this is, I guess, our bee library, where we have different activities we can do. Um, feeling we're in the story mode is all that's indicating. But I think there's, if you were to play this game further, encourage everybody to grab this for your own collection, play through it. We're going to make it further than we'll make it today, I'm sure. Um, looks like there's lots of game modes you can try out. Uh, I want to get to the point where it tells us where we can do co-op play. That's uh, all I'm trying to make it to. Maybe it's, maybe it's in when you have to get to the colony swarming. Ooh, maybe. That would be interesting. So where can you get this game? So this game is available on Steam. We're playing it through Steam right now on the cool. PC version. Um, but it's also available in the PlayStation and Xbox marketplaces as well. Maybe we can drop a link into uh, the chat with uh, the Steam link at the very least. Uh, it is a small publisher, small uh, developer who made this. So. We are looking for Epic Pollen. <laughs> Unreal Engine game, of course we're going to have Epic Pollen. That, that makes sense. Um, okay, so we're doing some dancing now. Um, so this looks like joystick controls. I can't look down because they give the controls in Xbox oh. language and if I look down the PlayStation controller is going to really confuse me. <laughs> so. This is like Simon Says. Yeah, I don't totally get this. <laughs> okay, we go this way. Here we go. Oh, it's stacking. So I only need to do the up now. There we go. And now, go to the left. Oh, I thought you did all three of them. Right? So yeah, so they're repeating the full series each time. No, nope, I screwed that up. Okay, there we go. Now I go up. Uh, I think you have to do the whole series, don't you? You do the first one, try the first one. All right, now when it goes, and then it does that, do both of them, see what it does. Well, that time I just did yeah, I know. the but wrong one. Then how come it always <laughs> takes one away when you just do the left one? Just left roll. Uh, if you 
do just a left roll, but it always takes that second thing away. Well, that one, I just <laughs> pressed the button in the wrong direction. <laughs> that wasn't even a good attempt. Uh, we had a question, what is royal jelly made of? I think we were chatting about it earlier, but molecularly. Uh, that, I don't know. I, I don't know exactly what royal jelly is composed of. It's it's one of those very complex things. I know this sounds like an evasive answer, <laughs> but literally a lot of things, even even you know Dr. Tarpey here at NC State who studies honeybees, there's a lot of things about the pheromones and the communication of honeybees that is not understood. So I'm not sure exactly if they know exactly what's in uh, royal jelly. It's so complex. But that is a really good question. Okay, we think it's right roll at this point. You can try it. Because it did. Nope, no, that was bad. No. Can you do the four? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. There we go. There's the okay. front. Okay. See you, that, but when it when it does that one to its right, or your oh, unless you have to go to your right. Again. I'll, I'll go to my right. Here we go. Try. Video games. But then, yeah, see, okay. This is this is where I would be throwing the controller like through the screen. <laughs> so I'm not a good video gamer. Uh, okay. Yes. They do find it interesting enough to harvest, but like I said, it's one of those things where it's got those kind of myth mystical properties that people think it's going to make them you know, more beautiful or more healthy or they can make a lot of money off of it. That's why you, when you find things that are just royal jelly, it, it's really more of a placebo than anything else. It's not going to do anything. It does things for the bees, obviously, but it, it won't do anything for humans. I've actually never even tried royal jelly. Yeah, there's a Futurama episode where they go to an alien planet to steal alien bee royal jelly. Um, and I tried not to learn my <laughs> biology from Futurama, so. Extent of my knowledge. Being driven absolutely insane by this test. Okay, try going to your right. Okay, oh, sorry, I just. No, 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 no. You're, well, see, the thing is, if you did it the same way, I mean, the same direction, even though its left is your right, obviously. Okay, so. You did that, and it was correct. Okay, okay. there we go. Now we're going so now, up. Okay, so you go up. But no. then when it goes to its right. Okay, so it did want the full sequence there. I'm also using now the D-pad instead of the okay. joystick and it might act differently. So here, let's do the full sequence. Okay. Right. Oh. Uh, and then to the other side. It's okay. that the joystick doesn't act the same oh, way. It's, I see. Yeah. Well, now you have to do the whole thing and then... Oh, but now we're a master because we've practiced 3,000 times. There Especially with the backwards roll. <laughs> <laughs> we did it. Thanks for the help in the chat. We would not have made it through that one. There we go. Earn knowledge points Ooh. by completing challenges. Their markers are colored by type. Um, okay, so... Oh, we love to dance, so we'll watch Sting out Sting the bully. I like oh, okay. We're looking for bully. orange challenges then. Um, green, gay. Sting the bully. <laughs> Applause in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> Pro gamers. We're looking for orange. Okay, there's green. It is really calm though, like that whole um, where you jump in Grand Theft Auto and just drive around, not really doing anything. I could do that just uh, in with this B, just Microsoft Flight Simulator, but you're a B. So I wonder if the little white, like what looks like wind. I wonder if you can catch that as a. Get a little boost. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Like it. Do zoos keep um, bee populations? Are there any other types of like businesses that keep bees as part of their business? That would be surprising. Uh, some some places now are doing it just to show that they're good for the pollinators. Mm -hmm. Like I think BSF K 
keeps a couple colonies. They also do some native bee habitats. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the North Carolina Zoo actually has a really nice honeybee. The, the North Carolina Honeybee Keepers Association maintain it. Um, and they keep a colony of bees there um, in, in the observation hive, which is one of those hives that has like plexiglass on, or glass mm -hmm. on either side, so you can actually see the bees running around I used around to love inside. going to apple farms as a kid, yeah. and they would have those. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're great. We have one at the museum in, in the discovery room. There's one. It's obviously closed uh, currently, but, uh, but there's an observation hive in there, and Jan Weems, who runs that, and Sarah Safley keep that going. And It's great just going in there and just watching the bees do the waggle dance and go out the entrance and, and um, go out and find the nectar sources and things like that. So in downtown Raleigh, what would a, are those nectar sources the overturned cup of ice cream more often it, than? Sometimes, yeah. I mean, there are, there are enough people that have small gardens, because bees will travel, you know, miles to get uh, a nectar and pollen sources. And it's a little bit harder, harder in, in urban environments. Um, but around here, it's the urban, Ness of Raleigh is so small compared to the suburbs, mm -hmm. right? So everybody has a garden, there are enough flowers going on. The biggest danger, like I said before, is just everybody spraying so many different pesticides and, and insecticides, and it really does affect the bees. So they'll either kill them on the spot or they take it back to the hive, and then it just um, amplifies in the hive, and it's just not obviously good for the hive. In like a residential urban environment, what is the, like those pesticides, are they individual homeowners that need to be educated on that or is it more uh, larger industrial spraying and things like well, that? Well, it's more individual homeowners. Um, like in, if you go out, say, east of here where there are a lot more like commercial farms, um, then it would be, you know, people, you know, farming and they're, they're spraying the crops for other pests, mm -hmm. you know, like cutworm or you know, something that would be feeding on you know, corn or whatever they're growing or soybeans or like soybean loopers, um, which if it's a specific, you know, if they're using something like Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a bacterium which is specific to the caterpillar, right, mm -hmm. De depending on the, the subspecies of it, um, it's not going to affect the bees whatsoever. But when you have a broadcast general insecticide, in which most homeowners will use because they hate seeing anything including ants or anything running around <laughs> their yards, it'll kill anything. Um, and so that's why I always tell people, instead of spraying, especially the mosquito fogging people, one of my neighbors does that and it drives me bonkers. Um, they that, claim- That's a pretty general kind of, it's not. Yeah, it, it's, it, it, they say it's specific for the, for the uh, mosquitoes, but it's not. It, it broadcasts and it kills a lot of different things. Um, and you just have to be really careful of things like that, because that's where you know, it, it, you're poisoning a lot of things, and we don't know all the effects that it has on humans as well. So, mm. you know, even though they say it's totally safe for your kids to run around in the backyard 15 minutes after. Yeah, the you know, story on that often changes yeah, decades uh -huh. later. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's something to be, be cautious of. Um, but yeah, so in an urban environment, it's more of just letting the homeowners know that there are other ways you can do it. Like, if you have mosquitoes in your backyard, don't fog your yard for them. Just if you have standing water, like if you have a bird bath, dump out the bird bath and refill it, you know, every like once a week or every couple of days so the adult, so you're killing off the larvae and you never have the adult mosquitoes there. So simple mechanical things will take care of um, a lot of the pests. Rather right than, than chemical solutions yes, exactly. right away. Huh. Um, we got some great questions. Uh, why do some bees like uh, sweat? Uh, human sweat. Oh, sweat like sweat bees, um, or actually most bees, because they're actually going after the minerals in mm -hmm. your sweat, and that's why you see sometimes you'll see butterflies landing on, like a like if there's a muddy trail and there's mm -hmm. a puddle, they're actually going after the salts and and, and the minerals uh, on the edge that's coming out of the coming mud. out into solution into so the water. so like sweat bees especially the 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 helicted bees which I love helicted bees they're beautiful little bees. They'll land on you because they're just literally getting the salts off your sweat. And, okay. And that's what they're using for part of their nutrition. We want to do the side quest? The foster family. And we'll let's learn about it. another relationship here. Okay, so we got a, a squirrel that's talking to us. Yeah, I don't <laughs> I don't know if the, the as much modeling effort went into the mammals <laughs> as into the insects maybe, but um, Oh, it's a it's a baby squirrel, so it might not be what we're used to seeing out of the nest. 
So we're looking for a mother squirrel. Chicos, we need to find uh, we need to find Groucho and Harpo and <laughs> Zeppo, and we're all set. Uh, I went down a massive rabbit hole of watching all the Marx Brothers oh stuff <laughs> last year when uh, we were all at home. I watched a lot of um, What's My Line, mm -hmm. um, his uh, radio show yeah. that then became oh, one of those crossover early television shows that was really just radio on TV. Um, pretty cool. He's a funny guy. Um, we have a comment here that somebody's very excited when they see ants in their garden, uh, particularly around their passion fruit. Um, passion fruit um, is, I believe, introduced um, in North Carolina, right? That's not Probably. a native plant. Yeah. Nope. Are there, uh, I, are bees and native bees, uh, well, I guess the European honeybees aren't, uh, are introduced as well, but mm -hmm. are native bee populations more prone to interact with uh, other native species, or do they kind of see pollen as pollen to some extent? Well, or? some of them are, some of them are specific to certain plants, uh, and some of them are early emergers, so like some of the ground nesting bees like minor bees or cellophane bees um, will be out in like February literally and there's not much blooming except like winter jasmine and really really early blooming things or, or like um, red bud and so they're only going after those because those are the only things blooming but when you have like helictids or other kind of leaf cutter bees they'll go after whatever uh, whatever is blooming but they're not necessarily um, going to go after like just passion fruit. I think it's just that they're, you know, it's more of opportunistic more than anything. What are leaf cutter bees? I don't think I've heard of, I've obviously yeah. heard of leaf cutter ants. Yeah, leaf cutter bees, they do the same thing. Not, well, leaf cutter ants actually take the leaves back and they actually feed off of the fungus that grows on the leaves. Mm -hmm. But leaf cutter bees will actually take a trim of leaf, and you can always tell when leaf cutter bees are there because they, they do these perfect circles cut out of the edge of the leaves. And they, they take it back and they're building their cells for each one of the larvae. They're lining like they go in, say, an old beetle burrow in a tree. And they'll, they'll line the burrow with these leaves. Once again, it's, they're keeping it clean. You know, it, it's a nice clean place for their, their larvae to grow up. And then they'll put in a pollen ball, lay an egg, and seal that off with another leaf. So there are all these little oh. cells just of, of made up of cut pieces of leaves. Um, but they're once again really efficient pollinators, uh, and they're because they're they want to be more efficient because they're collecting the pollen to feed their their young. But they're not just stealing the pollen; they're actually helping the plants because they're they're once again flower constancy. They're going to the same type of flowers, and they have more pollen on their bodies, so they can actually pollinate a lot more efficiently. Like bumblebees are actually more efficient pollinators because they do what's known as buzz pollination. They'll go in to get the nectar and they'll buzz their wings, huh. um, and so all the pollen will get shaken off, and then they'll go to the next, like, t especially with like tomatoes, things like that. That's are better pollinators for tomatoes. What's the alternative to that? Are there other like pollen you know, aerosolization strategies, uh, or is, it, is that kind of a unique one to throw pollen up into the air? For, oh no, the, yeah, they don't throw it off the air, it's just they're shaking it so the, so the stamen will just shake all the pollen off Oh, right onto, onto them. Yeah, oh, exactly. okay. Because they are, once again, bumblebees are the same way. They actually feed their larvae the, the pollen. Oh, blue passion flower. Oh, so yeah, I was, um, yeah, I was thinking of blue passion flower as um, being highly invasive. We still haven't seen Chico's mom here, so uh, I'll do a little bit of squirrel. I was going to say, maybe Chico's mom is in the, the tree where your hide is? Oh, maybe, yeah, we can look up. So have these, um, not to jump ahead in what I think the storyline might be here, but this tree doesn't look like it's doing too hot. Will bees kill out the uh, nope. trees that they're... Nope, nope. They, they, will, they will find a tree hollow um, and build a nest in it. Okay. Like there's one right downtown, like right down the street from the museum itself, down on Jones Street. It's been there for years. Um, and they, but they don't kill the tree itself. The tree, if it's got a, the big hollow in it, um, it's either on its way out or that hollow is there for some other reason, like, you know, some kind of a rot. Yeah, like fungus a, or something. Right. 
but yeah, no, they don't. They don't excavate anymore. Whatever. That's why when they go around when the scout bees when they're looking to swarm, they'll actually find the right size hole in the tree, but they don't. They don't like create a larger hole whatsoever. Oh, that was a that was quite a collision. Okay, this is just Chica. I don't think. Hello, are you Chico's mommy? Oh no, this isn't Chica. It's just, it's just the resemblance got me. Oh well. Oh, wrong, wrong squirrel. Well, so you have to look for these beacons of light. Is that? I think so. I think oh, each squirrel is one of these little beacons. Hmm. Squirrel quest. Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> hey, you're talking to me. <laughs> like over in New York. <laughs> yeah, the New York for squirrels. Keep your head down and look at your phone as you're uh, climbing around in the tree. Um, <laughs> Sandy's a long way from Bikini Bottom. Uh, are there cases where it's better for a hive to remove the tree that they're in? Uh, or because it's a danger to them? Or is there... Uh, considerations where you can keep a tree barely alive or cut it back for the stability of a hive or anything like that? No, not really. I mean, if if, if you have a tree, like, like say you have a, a dead tree in your yard, there's a snag, right, and like a, it, it, usually those, they'll, they'll, you'll get woodpeckers in there that are building a nest in there, um, but there's nothing you can really do to create you know, or protect a tree. Because once a tree is dead dead and there's a tree hollow in there, it's just gonna keep rotting. Mm -hmm. There's nothing really to preserve it. Him who? It's a secret squirrel. Yes, that's him. Him who? Yeah, uh, Who's up first? It's a squirrel. <laughs> I don't think they're the brightest. <laughs> yeah. So how do you get Mommy to Excuse me. I'm trying to Chico. find Chico's mommy. That's on me. I'm cat. Uh. You're a cat. Oh. <laughs> Sheesh. Alas, can I go through this fence? That's cool. Yeah. Okay, let's go up and get. So about how high off the ground will bees comfortably fly? Am I gonna That's a good question. run out of oxygen? No, no. And bees don't get up to like 30,000 feet or anything okay. like that. They'll fly, I mean, they'll fly as high as they need to uh, to cut the distance, but they're, they're, it's not like they're flying at, you know, airplane levels. <laughs> Is there anything I can build that would attract uh, colonial bees to a nest? No. No, I mean, they do sell what are known as um, swarm traps, and they kind of look like a like a compostable pot for for uh, plants, you know what I mean, that, that you put in the ground that would, that would decompose. Um, and you can hang them up and you hang them like 15 foot in a tree, and if there's a swarm in your area, uh -huh. if somebody has hives that have swarmed, and they might fly in there, but you have to you know, keep the trap and, and check it regularly to make sure, because if they, they might go in a swarm trap, but then if you don't take them and you know, put them in like a, a Langstroth hive or something in, in, a, in a regular, you know, man-controlled farmed beehive, then they're just going to leave the hive again because it's not big enough for them to build their normal colony. Mm. Is that essentially what causes colonies to break off is volume constrictions? And yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so they will, a couple different things. If a, a swarm... Uh, or a, a colony may, like, if the conditions aren't right, like people set up a beehive and they're just like, oh my God, it's absolutely perfect. You know, it's in my yard and all this other stuff. They install a, a hive. The bees may do what's known as absconding. Like the whole colony will just go up and leave because it's not right for them, right? But if you have a colony that's going strong and it builds really huge and it's too big, like especially in the spring, um, Beekeepers consider it a bad thing because you're losing half of your bees because the queen will fly off with half the bees. And but become wild again, more or less? Yeah, they'll find somewhere. I mean, you could always, like, if you have swarm traps set up around your, they may just go to a swarm trap. And you can capture, like, a lot of times a, a swarm will hang out in an area for a couple days, like in, the, in a treetop or in a, on a tree branch or something until they find a suitable area to build a new hive. So if you're if you have a hive and it swarms, you just look around at some of the trees and maybe you can go collect it. I did that with a couple of my hives that swarmed. Um, but 
back when you know colonies were first introduced here and even back in the 1800s swarming was a good thing because that's the only way you could get more hives uh, right you okay. wanted your you it, it means your hive is doing really well and it's really yeah. healthy and so they're splitting off because they have so many bees um but nowadays you know obviously you don't want to leave lose half your hive so you you know when you're checking your hives you check them to make sure that they're not ready getting ready to swarm and then you do what's known as an artificial swarm mm. you'll take half the bees and the queen put them in a new area so the queen and those bees will think they swarmed Right? They get the idea that they've left, and so they're not overpopulated. And then the old location where that queen used to be, they don't have a queen, so they'll start making a new queen, and they'll just mm. keep doing their thing as if it swarmed. So it's just, it's, it's just bee management, st- management so strategy. An established, an established hive that has lost its queen is able to produce a new queen. If, if there are eggs or young larvae. Okay. If not, like if, if you, like your queen is or excuse me, if your colony's not doing that well and say the queen dies for some reason and there aren't like eggs or larvae in there, then that colony, unless you re- unless you buy a queen from a supplier, mm-hmm. that the colony's probably gonna die because there's no other way they can produce eggs. Are there chemical signals that we can introduce to encourage them along that path or tell them that there's an absence of their queen quicker than no, they detect they'll, they'll or they know they're, Trust right me, if, if you take a queen out of a hive within a few hours, the bees know that the queen is not there because the, 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 there, there's a queen pheromone that gets released through the hive, and they generally, when a when a hive goes queenless, the bees just they start acting a little bit edgy, right? Mm. They know unless they already have a new queen cell built, and they know a new queen's on the way, then they're a little bit calmer. But if you like a, take a queen out and like put her somewhere else, the queenless hive will they'll basically just be grumpy and you don't want to mess with them. And on the library's YouTube page is a fantastic 360 degree video of Dr. David Tarpey doing that oh, process exactly, I very think. Very cool. Yeah, right. Lifting a queen out of one hive to demonstrate for a group of students uh, the phenomenon that'll happen. I love the little case they put in there, the little yeah, cage. Yeah, 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 that's really cute. So we found Chico's mom. Uh, while we were chatting there. Or sorry, we found Chico's new mom who's going to uh, foster Chico because I don't think uh, his mother is around mm-hmm. anymore, it doesn't sound like. Um, Poor Chico. Yeah, but at least we found a new home there and now we're buzzing around the zoo again. Uh, we got lots of challenges we can do. I was kind of just making my way towards the city here a little. We had some great, uh, great questions, though. Um, so if <laughs> Can we just talk about the tragic story of Chico <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of just dropped in our lap there that we had a very sad squirrel story. Squirrel tragedy within a bee comedy, uh, classic genre. Um, so I've heard that one defense strategy of some bees is to swarm and vibrate around an enemy, roasting them with the generated heat. Yep. Given that, how feasible is it to construct a bee-powered uh, microwave, we'll say, cooking device? Uh, I don't know <laughs> if you want to answer those as two separate questions. Well, but. if you want your food to take like hours and hours and hours to cook, because they they will actually, when they're cooking, say the, the, the um, bee wolves, um, which are the Asian hornets that everybody's all freaked out about because they get introduced to the West Coast. They're not here, people. Relax. <laughs> the big, big wasps you're seeing here are not are not the, the murder hornets, uh, at least not North Carolina. Uh, but in, in Asia, where they're native to, the native Asian honeybees, which is Apis, uh, oh, I can't remember the species now. It's not Apis mellifera, it's Apis something. Or somebody's going to look it up and probably put it in the chat. Um, but they will actually ball, what's known as balling, those, those um, bee wolves, and they literally will surround it and they'll vibrate their wing muscles to heat up enough. It's like a hundred and I want to say it's 112 degrees or 113 degrees and it's one degree less than would kill them. So they're, they're heating up the thing just enough to kill the bee wolf, but it does not kill the bees themselves. I mean, that's evolution in that's action, astounding. right? Yeah. And that's why with these things being introduced here and just like with varroa mites and all these other things, the bees that we have have not evolved with the, because the varroa mites are, are also from Asia. And so the Asian honeybees have evolved with them and they have a different, essentially, um, growth rate 
to, to combat the, the mites and so they don't kill off a colony. Oh, um, and so the European honeybees have not evolved with them, and so it is just like any other introduced problem. It, it doesn't have the right predators or the right um, evolutionary strategy. Is there, um, so this is, we, I guess we think of pollinators, and in some cases pollinators and GM crops get kind of put on two sides of uh, the issue, but are mm -hmm. there GM varieties of pollinators uh, being played with or anything like that? Um, that, I don't think so. I think they're, they are trying to breed bees, um, not necessarily, you know, any kind of genetic manipulation besides the breeding, which when you think about it, the, with the GM crops, I mean, even what we know as maize or corn mm -hmm. is a genetically modified crop because, yeah. you know, Tiu Tincte, which yeah, was tiny. the side, right? Yeah, you know, so over a thousand of years, like yes, the side exactly. Of your finger, yeah. And so when we have an ear of corn, you know, that's obviously been messed with enough by selective breeding. So with bees, they're trying to do the same thing and get them to be resistant to things like varroa mites. Um, but but not like it's not like you know in the movies where they zap it with something or mm -hmm. you know, inject it with something and also you get the super colony. Yeah. Which if they didn't do that, you don't know what else you're getting out of it. So there's always a trade-off, right? Yeah, yeah. I know gene drive technology has been talked about in insect populations, at least primarily within any animal population I've heard of. So, because well, they're easier, I don't say easier to manipulate, but it takes a lot less time for a generation so they can see the results of it rather mm. than like yeah. doing it on an elephant or you know, you're gonna, yeah. you're gonna wait a while for that to grow up. Yeah. Your grandkids can tell you how the experiment <laughs> turned out maybe. Um, so we've got some honey we have to, or some pollen we have to drop off here. Oh, or some more. if you want to boil water with bees. <laughs> Fahrenheit or Celsius, I believe it's Fahrenheit. I do not believe it's Celsius. That would be a heck of a heat Yeah, tolerance. I was gonna say, because if it's 100 and 112 degrees Celsius, that would be over the boiling point. Yeah, they'd have to be yeah, <laughs> keeping so the 112 water degrees Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. I, think it's, I think it's 112 or 115. I forget which one it is. Um, but it's just cool. It's one degree shy of what we killed them. That's why I think it's the most fantastic thing. You may have seen my experiments of trying to dive bomb into the water there. Uh, it didn't work? It did not, oh. but it does uh, lead to a good question of what is a bee's relationship with water. I know I've found lots of bees in pools and stuff I'm skimming, but um, are, is that just because they die over water? Or no, they, they? they're they actually going, they're collecting water because when during the summer when it's really, really hot, they are actually cooling the hive. They'll actually use the water and fan their wings. And so they're basically just like a like what we consider a swamp cooler out west. Mm -hmm. So it's evaporative cooling. So they're using the water as evaporative cooling to cool off that hive because the they always may, even during the winter, they maintain the hive at 96 degrees Fahrenheit, not Celsius. Um, and so they're, they're maintaining that hive even during the summer. So that's why if you open it up on a hot summer day, they don't necessarily like it. They're going to be more agitated because you're letting the heat in, essentially. Just like in the winter time, even though they're, they're doing what's known as they're, they're, they're clustering and they're keeping the queen nice and warm, Inside that cluster, they're keeping it at 96 degrees, and they're they're constantly shifting around and vibrating the wings. That's why it's important to keep enough feed in the beehive so that they can get the carbohydrates to keep their wings going. Yeah, keep their muscles going. Is there any? Are there any animals that leach that heat off of beehives and hang out around them for the? Access Sometimes you get mice in your hives. Okay. Um, you have to put mouse guards on the bottom of it so mice can't get in there. But if you get mice in there. The mice will, you know, use the warmth. It's it's, it's nice and toasty. The bees, because they're clustered, they don't know the mice are there, um, and so they will, like during the summertime when the bees are active, the mice will get literally get stung to death, um, or they won't even get in the hive. But uh, during the winter time, the, the the mice will hang out in there and build a little nest, and then they'll start eating some of the comb and some of the honey and stuff like that, and potentially even some of the bees because the bees don't really get defensive; they're just trying to keep it warm. So. So yeah, it's it's always once again, it's just management, just like management of it. They're they're essentially um, like any other livestock animal. I hate saying that like yeah. that because I love just watching my bees. You know what I mean? And I love the smell when they bring me nectar and things like that. But you have to manage them just like any other any other animal that you're trying to get some kind of resource off of, whether it's pollination or the honey itself. Huh? Yeah, that's really interesting to hear. 
Um, we're doing another squirrel quest in this game about, about that's actually secretly about squirrels. Um, I, but your point about the mice eating actual bees reminds me. I had wanted to ask you. I had heard that when bears eat beehives, they are not simply looking for sugars. They are also looking for proteins. Yeah, so they're eating true? larvae. Yeah, that's why. That's why they'll go after. I mean, honeybees, but bumblebee hives because bumblebees a lot of times will just nest in like really tall grass or, 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 or grassy areas. And so when when bears find that, it's just like the the best. I mean, the honey is an a nice treat for them, right? But they, they actually want the protein. That's just like when bears are fattening up for the winter, they'll just peel the skin off, like if they're going after salmon in the mm -hmm. Pacific Northwest, they'll just peel that fat off to eat the fat. So the, uh, the protein of the larvae are what they're going after as much as the honey. Itself. Yeah, protein's hard to get, especially sometimes a year. Cool, let's do, uh, we're gonna help Lisa collect food. I imagine the acorns or something. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Well, look for our beacons. I think our beacons oh, have been pretty. Uh, well, that's one thing. Good thing about the game too is we were saying about the pathfinding is not that great, but if as long as there are beacons, so you know what you're looking for. Because otherwise, trying to find that mother squirrel would have been a real pain in the rear end. Yeah, everybody's played a game where they just cannot figure out oh, what the game wants yeah. them to do, and they end up putting it down. Um, I remember. I still remember games from. 15 years ago that <laughs> I just couldn't figure out what they wanted me to do. Um, visual language. So what um, what got you interested in bees originally? Did Were you around this as a kid or growing up? No, or? That, that was one of those, it's just like being an entomologist, I mean, you know, most people think, oh, you're an entomologist, do you like bees? It's like, yeah, not at all. It, it was just one of those things. I mean, it's just like being an entomologist. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I went to college, and I took an entomology course when I was a junior, and I'm just like, this is what I want to do with my life. And didn't, you know, everybody thought I was crazy. It's like saying, I'm going to collect, you know, aluminum cans for my life, and, <laughs> you know, uh, it being a good career path. Um, but but then, you know, just, they're, they're fascinating, right? And so I was just, it was only about five, six years ago that I'm just like, I'm going to read up and try to keep bees i just it seems like something would be perfect we have you know house with a yard and i can try it and i have cool neighbors which mm -hmm. totally were behind me 100 percent uh they weren't you know some neighbors are just like oh my god no you're gonna sting my child children and all this type yeah. of stuff but anyway so it was just the right situation i just read up on it and and just tried it and i totally enjoy it it's it's one of those fun things but like i said it, it's work a lot of people and a lot of the issue with colony collapse disorder and all this that people are panicking about, um, and this isn't this is my viewpoint. A lot of times, people, you know, they think that it's just like, oh, I'm gonna get some bees and put them in the backyard and get honey, and they just like it's like getting a puppy, putting it in your backyard for a couple months and expecting a well-trained dog. Mm -hmm. it, it's the same concept. So you have to manage them, you have to check on them, you have to make sure they're doing okay, and if they're not. You know, figure out what's going on. You can take classes or, or, or do whatever it suits you, but you can't just—it's not a set it and forget it. And so, um, a lot of times with this, people were panicking. It was like we're losing so many beehives. A lot of them were people reporting. It's like, oh my bees died. Oh my bees died, and they just weren't taking care of their hives. Oh, you know, okay. and that—that's complete speculation on my part. But I, I would think that a lot of people, if you really looked at the number of hives that were claimed to have died, it wasn't just because, you know, of, of natural occurring things. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, there is a combination of different, there are different viruses that hit the bees and varroa mites hit, um, and it seemed all at the same time, so it was really affecting them, and varroa mites just got introduced here in like the 90s, and before that, like if you raised bees in the 60s and 70s, or even before that, you could literally just set bees in the backyard and just collect honey in the fall. But it doesn't work that way anymore. It is a serious. If you don't treat your bees, you have dead colonies. That's all that's it is. Um, so there is a there is a factor to it. And here we go. We got a beer coming up. Yeah. But anyway, so so it's just it's it's not that it's not a big deal, but it's not the problem that people think it is. It's multiple issues right. built into getting grouped as exactly. one in some cases. Right. And you know, and like we were saying before about the whole climate change issue with this, the you know the overall scope of this. It's affecting all bees and not just honeybees. And mm -hmm. so it's a big concern because with different 
like areas warming, um, like bumblebees are probably affected more because they have very specialized habitats. There are more species actually up in the north, like in Canada, in certain areas in California than there are down south here. And so as those areas warm, they lose habitat faster than bees that are adapted to warmer climates. Um, whoop. Oh no, here we go. I'm not sure I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Oh, okay, huh? I just need to do it three times. So what are the major um, ramifications of climate change kind of generally for um, pollinator populations? Well, as the, you know, the habitat, it's kind of like, you know, the, the, the marmots or anything like that, you know, they keep getting pushed higher and higher and higher, you know, up to where they're, where they're comfortable, where they can survive. And same thing with certain bees, if their food plants lose their habitat or they keep getting pushed into an environment where they can't effectively flower because the, the season's too short, right? Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, they lose their habitat altogether, then the bee, if it's specialist, it's gonna lose its food. Oh. And, you know, even if it's a generalist, it's not going to be able to find as much food, um, even with invasives coming in, because invasives may not, you know, provide enough pollen or the right kind of pollen or, or, or even nectar um, for these things. With the generalist versus specialist dynamic, is there a fear of little by little and then all at once kind of phenomenon with climate change where they might have some degree of learned generalism, but then there's an extent to it or things like that or is it really you can just track it from early impacts hmm. that's a good question i would i would think that you know once a specialist always a specialist you're not going to get a specialist turning into a generalist because they've evolved with mm -hmm. that plant you know it's like a co-evolutionary thing um, but a generalist can most of them like honeybees they can you know we can introduce them here there weren't the same plants we had in europe so they can, you know, feed or, or pollinate or, or gather nectar and honey from almost anything, um, but certain things that need a certain habitat to to live or to build their nest or something is going to have more of a problem, even if they're a generalist feeder. Like I said, like bumblebees, they only live in certain areas, like ones that only live up in certain areas, um, northern Canada or Alaska, they're going to have a harder time finding suitable habitat. You know, as, mm. as things, you know, warm up or change. Yeah. It may not just be warming. It might just be extended winters, um, and that just may mess up, all, you know, all the different floral cycles and, and even their emergence times, yeah. things like that. Yeah, if you're linked to another species like that, that's usually bad news mm -hmm. in a changing environment. Uh, I guess I didn't realize the extent of specialism um, or specialization amongst them. Oh. Lost a camera here. Let's, uh, let's see here. Uh, we had a question while well, I mess with this uh, camera just a little bit. We had a question about um, if there's been any innovations to make beekeeping easier for amateurs or people who might not be as familiar with it. Um, is there anything in that? The, the best innovation people have tried innovating hives in certain ways they've tried there's a um something called the flow hive which makes it easier to extract honey mm -hmm. which is debatable some people swear by it and other people have tested it and it's just like it, you still have to maintain the colonies the the way that it's made it the easiest uh, and this is from an old person speaking <laughs> is the communication email youtube the way we can communicate um, with other beekeepers. There's like a website called Bee Source. Um, I think it's beesource.com where you can ask all these questions and there are people that have been beekeeping for you know 20 years like Michael Birch in Oklahoma. Um, and they're, they're super nice people. They're, it's not like some um, professions where you get like snobbery. Most of the time beekeepers 
want to share their knowledge and they like talking to other beekeepers. It's what you're into, you know what I mean? It's like people into cars want to talk about cars. Right. Um, so that's been the greatest innovation is just being able to communicate a lot easier with um, with other beekeepers. I have you star on that oh. camera. And the name tags already work. I'd rather that. be, I was going to say, I'd rather be a disembodied voice. <laughs> <laughs> that works. I'll be the disembodied <laughs> controller. <laughs> 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 Um, are there types of bees? So you mentioned that people s hear about colony collapse, they hear about climate change impacts on pollinators, and they want to start, you know, um, breeding and maintaining honeybees. Mm -hmm. Are there types of bee populations that, if enthusiasts were to adopt them, it would be probably more beneficial? Or, well, I mean, you can, yes, if you wanted to make habitat you know, in your yard for um, different native pollinators like leafcutter bees or ground nesting bees. Um, just literally search for creating habitats. And you've had like the Xerces Society, which, you know, started with bumblebees. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they have all this information on different native bee habitats, including, you know, you can build um, habitats for bumblebees a little bit easier. Bumblebee houses that you can make don't, they don't work as well. Bumblebees like old, you know, like mouse um, burrows and things oh, like that okay. in the ground. You can try to simulate it, but they're they're not shown to be that effective. You can try it, but like taking an old tree stump, and if you drill a bunch of holes in it with a really really long drill, you know the the native bees will find that the the, the cavity nesting bees will find that. Now you're gonna you have to do this early because, like I said, a lot of them emerge in like February, early March when, you know, not around here the snow necessarily, but but uh, most people think, oh, you know, I'm all, I'm all ready, I'll put it out like in April when I see honeybees flying around, it, it's way too late for mm -hmm. these things are ready. They're, they're coming out of the ground like in February or um, wherever they're nesting, but there are different ways you can, like the ground nesting bees, if you, you can have a section of your yard and you mix, I forget what the proportions are, it's like, you know, like beach sand, and um, topsoil and then gravel or something in certain proportions where it's the perfect nesting material for them, they will find that. They'll cue off of that. And that's why you see them coming back to the same like eastern facing hillsides because it's the right loamy sandy material that they can burrow into and it drains really well and so they're, they're babies essentially that are in there won't get waterlogged. Um, so yeah, a lot of different things you can do as far as habitat goes um, to, to draw in native bees. Now, it's the old, the old um, thing, you know, if, if you build it, they won't necessarily come right away, right? They have to, something has to stumble upon it. So there's no way to really attract them. And if you're interested in the honeybees, like I said, you know, read up on it, you know, watch YouTube videos of it. Be wary of the YouTube videos or any kind of videos where people are just like, oh yeah, it's just easy, you just throw this up. And if anybody says it's easy, just go to some other channel, you know, go somewhere else. <laughs> it is, it's not that it's super difficult, anybody really can do it, it's just, you have to put the time into it, just yeah. like anything else, right? Any, you know, just like anything, and nothing, nothing's uh, truly easy or free. You always have to pay for it in some way. Well, you talked about the community of, uh, you know, beekeepers helping beekeepers. Mm -hmm. Do we live in a, it's been kind of my perception maybe this is that Burt's Bees and some other kind of companies that are in the industry are around here, but do we live in a hotbed of kind of apiaries and of beekeepers? I mean, every state has them. I mean, there are there are state apiary associations in, in every state. Um, but North Carolina, because of all the agriculture and because of the you know, the, the different range all the way from, you know, the coast to the mountains. Um, you have, you know, the, the North Carolina Beekeepers Association and a lot of the counties, like there's a Wake County Beekeepers mm -hmm. Association, there's a Buntcombe Beekeepers Association. So there are all these different associations and these smaller um, groups. And beekeeping is very local. So if you're watching somebody up in New England, what they do is not going to necessarily work here in North Carolina. Not only because the climate's totally different, but the floor is totally different. The time of year, you know, they have to like wrap their hives because it gets so much colder. We don't get 30 below temperatures for a couple months. I mean, I grew up in Wisconsin, so those types of things, you don't get that kind of weather here. Um, so, you know, always contact 
local beekeepers as far as like local information. Okay. That's, that's the best advice I can give. Is that something that extension agents would uh, interact there, with there, as well? There are extension agents that would help with it. Um, I'm not going to, you know, volunteer anybody like right, Dr. Right. Tarper or anybody because they're not going to want to field yeah. a bunch of calls. <laughs> but, but the first thing to do is check Wake County Beekeepers Association or whatever county you live in. Check for those associations. They have contact people. They actually have um, a lot of places will have classes. Uh, sometimes you have to pay for them, but they're well worth it. You know, it's like a series of like you know nine classes or something, and they take you through what equipment do you need, what things do you, what things should you look for. You know, they have experts in beekeeping field coming and talking to you about what you see if you have varroa mites or you know if your colony is good or how, how you harvest your honey if you get lucky enough to get honey that year. Um, and it's also the fact that it's it's very seasonal, or I should say it's it's very weather dependent. Like t in in 2020, you know, it was the perfect not the perfect time because everybody's stuck at home. But you think, oh, all this time to do that, the the weather totally stunk. There was no nectar. The trees weren't flowering because it was it just kept getting it was plenty of rain, but it kept washing all the nectar out, so the bees weren't bringing anything in. Um, so. It, you know, you might have a really good year and get lots and lots of honey. Other years are either dry or too wet, and you don't get anything, and you just have to roll with it and just realize that that's part of it. You know, just like farmers have to deal with it. There's no rain. They're not going to get, you know, as big of a crop kind of thing. Huh. But it should be for the love of beekeeping and not for the end product. Mm. Are there times that's where the health of the hive and the quantity of honey will detach from each other as indicators, where a healthy hive just won't be very productive, or vice versa? Yes, yeah. So you can, you, I mean, you you might have a perfectly healthy hive, and they may not produce honey, but that's where you have to really pay attention to what's blooming, what the weather's been like, um, and you know if if anything's really producing nectar. Um, and, and once again, you know, these beekeeping associations or these websites where people are just like, oh, I, you know, I'm having tons of honey coming in or this or that, you just have to pay attention. It's like, okay, am I doing something wrong mm -hmm. or the flowers, you know, or the plants around me not blooming like they should or did my, like, I have neighbors that chop down all their trees and it's just like, oh my God, you're getting rid of all these trees. <laughs> and then they're planting like crepe myrtles, you know, things that aren't doing anything as far as I'm concerned yeah. for for the native um, fauna, but yeah, so there are, there are a lot of factors um, for for the beekeeping, and and you might have, you know, if they're not producing honey, that's why you check your hives regularly, like every couple of weeks, and and just make sure that it's like, oh, the population's really down, and you do a more thorough check. Is the queen there? Does anything else look off? Does it? Sm I mean, honestly, smell is the best indicator. Really, if it smells funny. There's probably something wrong with the hive because, like I said, uh, they keep it clean. A hive should smell good. It's like it should brewing smell almost, like na you, exactly. Yeah, yeah if, if you get some nasty brew going on, then then you've got some kind of a bacterial thing. So if a colony starts, you know, smelling kind of off, you know, if it if if, if it put it this way, if it smells off in the spring, there might be something wrong with it. You you better you know start investigating. If it smells like you can smell, it smells like flowers. Mm -hmm. It's doing great because oh. that it smells like that nectar that they're bringing in. Right. In yeah, the fall, you've been it's saying a the different. smell, then I haven't been able to imagine what the smell is, but yeah. it's the smell of flowers. I it's the smell it's of flowers. Pollen. It's some. It's it's a little bit different than flowers. It's kind of like if you open a jar of honey and it has that distinct scent, right? So it's it's a it's not like smelling a flower. It's not like smelling you know um, what's like the the, the sweet. Uh, clematis or something like this. Not that like wow flowers. It's more of like this sweet honeyish floral scent. Whereas in the fall, even if your your hive is healthy, if you smell like dirty socks, that's actually goldenrod. So they're bringing in probably a lot of goldenrod. Interesting. But there's a you'll you'll be able to tell when it smells bad. Not like dirty socks, but if it smells bad like rot. Yeah, like yeah, it's yeah, just jab. bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. So. So yeah, yeah, a lot of like I said, it it it's a it's just you know practice, reading up on it, I mean, getting some experience with it. The best thing, if you are interested, <laughs> honestly, the best thing you can do is find somebody who has hives and who can be a mentor 
and work with them and their hives and see if you enjoy it. Some people think, oh my God, yeah, this is gonna be great. They, they, they hate it. They hate working with hives. They're scared of them. You shouldn't be scared of your bees because unless you're doing something to make them mad, you know, if you, if you gently, you open them up, you're calm. They can sense when you panic. So if you panic, then that means that, that they're gonna feel that in you and then they're gonna get all kind of tense and you're not gonna have a good time. So just like if a bee's flying around you, if you, if you start freaking out and you, you get really nervous, the bee's sensing that and they're like, oh, what's going on? And then they, they get really aggressive. So, huh. I'm, uh, I'm gonna go home and eat toast with honey on it, I think. I, uh, all this honey talk has me uh, hankering. Um, is there, I'm trying to think, we've talked a bit about Bugfest. I'd like to probably touch on Bugfest again to remind anybody who's hanging on with us here till the end about uh, the dates for that. Um, but is there anything about your work at the museum or other opportunities to kind of see some of the phenomenon in action that we've talked about today in the area that we want to share? Uh, nothing at the museum itself. Like I said, unfortunately, the observation hive we have is not, it's back at, one of the, the people's houses now because we can't take care of it if the, if the, the room is closed due to the COVID situation. Um, but they're the best opportunity and if you're curious about um, honeybees or any kind of native bees or other insects, there are other insect talks going on. Like I said, go to naturalsciences.org or go to bugfest.org. I think it's .org or .com. I forget which one it is. Yep, there it is again. You know, yep. calendar bugfest. You can see the, the talks, all the talks are free. The, the, the Saturday the 18th from 9.30 to 12, it's absolutely free. It's the, the pollinator fest kind of thing. So it's an in-person, you can talk to people who are working with bees and working with native pollinators. And then there's that moth party that's going on from 8.30 to 10 o'clock at night. Um, on the same day on the 18th. But yeah, during the week, it's, it's all virtual things. So it's a little bit easier to log in, not saying you should not pay attention to your classes, people, but you can always log in <laughs> while you're in some other class and, and watch these people talking about their various subjects. Um, oh, that's awesome, some, yeah. Some more bee things. It's one of the great local events that I look forward to every yeah. year. Yeah. Right and, up there. and it is more fun. We're hoping, <laughs> hoping by next year it can be in person again, but due to the situation. But yeah, when it's in person, it's even more fun. Mm -hmm. All, both buildings in the museum, all seven floors, or actually eight floors, are completely packed just with stations and, and information tables and, and all the different things, and the Bicentennial Mall outside. Mm. So yeah, it's a really, really fun event. Yeah, always with lots of NC State presence over yes, there too. Yes, exactly. Let's see, let's do one last honey run here, and then we might call it for the day. We never found Lisa's squirrel food, um, but we found lots of pollen. Thank you in the chat for acknowledging how much better I'm getting at flying as a bee. Um, what's, here's a good last question for us. What's the best way to help a variety of, variety of bees and not just honeybees? Um, is it simply the more natural pesticides and pesticide alternatives that were mentioned earlier? Yeah, else? more, well, let's just put it this way. Less pesticides in general Right, and you, if, if say you have some kind of a, a, a moth larvae that you want to get rid of in your garden, use something like Bacillus thuringiensis, which targets that specific thing, right? Unfortunately, it targets all caterpillars of any sort. So if you have swallowtail butterflies, it's unfortunately going to kill them too. Um, there's nothing that's very, very specific unless you hand pick them off. Um, but yes, less pesticides, you know, look into building more habitats for these native bees. Um, and that's, that's the, greatest, the greatest threat because of everybody building houses, people chopping down trees. And like, like I said, if, if you have a, a dead tree in your yard, you don't want anything falling on your house or, or where you live or hurting anybody. But those are habitats that people want to get rid of and that's one of the greatest habitats for these things to live. That's where they're, they're hanging out because you know, it's, it's the perfect place where they can you know, build a nest or their old beetle burrows, anything like that. If you have open areas in your yard, you know, don't mulch with heavy duty mulch. Use like chopped up leaves or have natural areas because they can still nest in the ground underneath those leaves and underneath the like the, the mashed up leaves, you know, things like that. Um, so, you know, really heavy bark type uh, 
um, mulches are too heavy for them to, to get down into the ground with. Cool. Um, yeah, little things like that, and and just yeah, like I said, look look at different mechanical ways to get rid of pests. And if you do have say something, unless it's like you know carpenter ants in your walls, having certain things in your yard is not bad. <laughs> if, if like like ants, people hate ants for whatever reason. Ants, man, they keep a lot of other pests at bay. So if you see ants, that's actually pretty pretty good in your yard because they're they're keeping a lot of other things you don't want around, mm -hmm. you know, out of your yard. Cool. That's look at it. Well, they it's the ants world we're just living yeah. in. It. Yeah, we're not exactly. we're not going to win that fight. <laughs> well, that might be a good place for us to call it. We're back here at home in our hive. Oh, wow. I'll go. Uh, I can park us in the library, maybe, so that uh, we can go check out some books, um, some e-books. But thank you so much for being with us today. Well, no, thank uh, this is actually Jared. something I am going to download. Yeah, you're going to check this one out. Yeah, Hopefully, this, we'll this uh, cool. they'll see a little surge in downloads here from us and our audience. But thanks to everybody for tuning in today. Uh, see you all at Bugfest, and uh, see you back here on Twitch. Okay, have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, guys. <laughs>